the space race, a battle between America and the Soviet Union to conquer the next frontier. But beyond the rocketry, the world's two superpowers were engaged in another high-stakes competition, the race to put the first black astronaut in space. To win, the United States would have to confront its ugly past. He announced to these people, Washington is trying to cram a nigger down our throats. I got a letter from some irate citizen that said that they were glad that he was dead because now there would be no coons on the moon. America's racism would become a big win for its Cold War rival, the USSR. The Soviet Union was able to point to the hypocrisy of the U.S. government. Were we doing propaganda? Of course we were doing propaganda. But how did diversity in the skies become a power move in the chess match of the Cold War? There was buzz around NASA that the Russians had flown a Cuban. Who would become the world's first black astronaut? Which superpower would get there first? And what would it all mean for the struggle for civil rights? This is the untold story. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration today chose the 35 persons who will ride the space shuttle into orbit and back. Among them are three blacks, one oriental, and six women. The three African Americans are Guyon Bluford Jr., Frederick Gregory, and Ronald McNair. They are all vying to become America's first black man in space. It appears the United States has taken a giant leap towards racial equality. There was all this excitement because uh, there were six women in the program and three African Americans. The excitement that was generated by this very diverse group was a most humbling experience for all of us. And I can see, you know, the gleam kind of in his eyes that he was uh, excited and ready for this. The space program was a principal means of propaganda for the United States of America. There's a reason why the rockets were painted white, and there is a reason why the words United States of America were painted from top to bottom. This was a message to people saying, if you want to be a great nation with a great economy, you need to rely on American technology. You need to rely on the American way of life. It has taken America 17 torturous years to arrive at the announcement. From the dawn of its space program, those with the right stuff have been all white and all male. And it's controversial, even in the 1960s. From the very first time that an American goes into space, you see editorials that say, when are we going to get a black astronaut? President John F. Kennedy had campaigned on a platform of civil rights and support for the space program. Seeing the huge upside of recruiting a black astronaut, the White House gives the Pentagon an order. There were some memos that went back and forth between Fred Dutton, who was a very close aide to the president, and Adam Yarmolinsky, who was the Pentagon's equal employment guy. Dutton sends a memo to Yarmolinsky saying it would be a good thing for America if the astronaut corps was opened to members of minority groups. Yarmolinsky writes back and says, in effect, we don't discriminate, anybody can become an astronaut. Dutton writes back and says, yeah, that's not good enough. We need a minority astronaut candidate, and I'm giving you a deadline. The Air Force responds fast. There's a young black pilot ready to start training. Captain Edward Dwight Jr. with a top aeronautics degree and 2,000 flying hours under his belt. I did not dream that I was going to become the first black astronaut. That never entered my mind, because that was a big obstacle standing in my way. And I knew that was going to be a racial component to that obstacle, but I didn't know it was going to be as sophisticated and as determined as it was. In charge of training pilots to recommend to NASA's astronaut program is U.S. Air Force flying ace Captain Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier. 
Captain Charles E. Yeager flew the experimental X-1 faster than the speed of sound in level flight. The first man in the world to accomplish this feat. They sent me down to Edwards to interview with him. He was one of my heroes. But Yeager is skeptical about integrating the program and says so years later in a memoir. We published our list of the first 11 students. The chief of staff, General Curtis LeMay, got on the phone and said, Bobby Kennedy wants a colored in space. Get one into your course. Do what you have to do, Yeager, but get that colored guy in. Evidently, the pressure was so great from the White House, we had no alternative but to pick Dwight and put him in the school. He was totally shocked that the Air Force power structure would force this to happen, not consult him, and not bring him into the loop and prepare for my coming down there. August 1962. The Air Force announces Dwight is to start phase one of the training, a set of grueling physical tests. The first phase is the academic qualifications, the flying record qualifications, and then the physical tests. They really take these men to their physical limits to see how they function in a centrifuge and how much stress they can take. And he passes that. When he gets to phase two, the black press explodes. Ed Dwight just becomes bigger and bigger as this goes through the process, simply because he's the first. The expectations keep growing. Every step he takes becomes increasingly important. It fed all my emotional needs and accomplishment and promise and aspirations. And I was living the life. This is definitely a sign of progress for the Negro in the country. People wanted to see him and listen to him and know that he was being chosen because of his competence and not because of his complexion. The next phase is the flying phase. Learning how to do maneuvers, and these men are tremendously competitive. Well, uh, we're turning out an entirely different breed of pilot here at the school. Uh, these guys will be working on programs all the way from the surface the Earth to space. A 29-year-old Negro says he is anxious to go into space. He's Captain Edward Dwight of the Air Force, selected to be an astronaut, the first of his race to be so designated. But behind the scenes, tensions are brewing between Yeager and the hotshot African-American pilot with movie star appeal. I was competing with him for publicity. And in his brain, I didn't deserve a, a one drop of ink. Chuck Yeager could have thought, why is this man getting all this press? He's just a pilot. Yeager also claims Dwight is struggling in the classroom. He just couldn't compete in the space course against the best of the crop of experienced military test pilots. We set up a special tutoring program. He worked hard, and so did his tutors, but he just couldn't hack it. There was no extra tutoring. It never happened. This whole idea that somebody had to sit down with me to get me through is absolutely absurd. Yeager doesn't think he's up to it, but Dwight graduates in October 63, eighth out of 16 in his class. He's recommended to NASA, along with 26 other candidates from around the country. Now it's up to the space agency to make its election. Uh, we'd like to introduce the new group of 14 astronauts. I'm Major uh, Edwin E. Aldrin, Jr. Uh, United States Air Force. Captain Bill Anders, Kirkland Air Force. Was there a Negro boy in the last 30 or so that you brought here for consideration? Uh, no, there was not. And Ed Dwight is not among them. Okay, I guess we're through, Paul. Everyone had known that there was a black man in contention. The group includes two who will fly to the moon. Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. They missed an enormous public relations opportunity. NASA had the opportunity to choose a black astronaut, and it didn't. Dwight claims Yeager was biased against him. He called 
all the instructors in, guys that were going to instruct me in test pilot school. And he announced to these people, uh, uh, Washington is trying to cram a nigger down our throats. And if he graduates, Kennedy wants to turn the space program into a black space program. Yeager has always denied he was prejudiced in his treatment of Dwight, but the allegations have lingered ever since. I was hauled on the carpet to answer charges of racism raised by Dwight and some of his friends. Many Southern whites who are honest will admit having problems about race in a general sense, but I didn't have to be the type who thought of all blacks as niggers to flunk Ed Dwight. We don't know if Chuck Yeager derailed Ed White's career, and historians have searched for evidence and haven't found it. Are you now, in fact, completely out of the astronaut program? Is there a possibility of you ever being back in? I don't know. I don't have any idea. Uh, it was sad for the nation, and I think that it was a lost opportunity because the opportunity was there for us to inspire young people of color to go and to be a part of space. And that's what he was gonna really become, the Jackie Robinson of the space program. You know, what's, what's happened to you uh, is a setback for civil rights opportunities. No, I would rather not comment on that. Had I succeeded, they wouldn't have no more excuses about how ignorant black people were, how they couldn't learn, how they couldn't accomplish. I was in the right place at the wrong time. You know. Dwight's rejection gives the Soviet Union a golden opportunity to slam the Americans. The Soviet state news agency, TASS, sends reports around the world saying Dwight was rejected for astronaut duty because he was a Negro. Well, there's no doubt that they used Ed Dwight not becoming an astronaut to their advantage. It was part of their playbook. That was something that the Soviets did all of the time. But soon, the Soviets will do more than criticize. They'll up the ante by looking for their own black astronaut. From the dawn of the space age, the Soviets have attacked America on civil rights. 1957. Violent protests shake Little Rock, Arkansas. White rioters block black students from attending school in defiance of a Supreme Court decision on school integration. The Soviet press has a field day. This was an incredibly important propaganda moment for the Soviet Union. They were able to show the world the hypocrisy between what America said it stood for and how it treated its own citizens. Little Rock makes world headlines, but it shares the spotlight with the starting gun of the space race. At exactly the same time, the Soviets launch Sputnik, the world's first satellite. The Soviets take their chance to taunt America by announcing on their international radio Moscow that Sputnik would be flying over racially divided Little Rock. Were we doing propaganda? Of course we were doing propaganda. That was the party line. At the time, the Soviet Union was given two major victories during the early days of the Cold War. Sputnik suggested that they were technologically superior, and Little Rock suggested that the U.S.'s social system was inferior. America's fear of falling behind turns to panic just four years later when Soviet Yuri Gagarin becomes the first man in space. He's 
It felt like everyone was celebrating. As if they participated in the space flight. He fulfilled a dream for all humanity. The cosmos became our power. It was our hope for the future. This is what space gave us. The Soviets sell Gagarin as a hero to all humanity and send him on a goodwill tour of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Everywhere except the US, the Kennedy administration bars his entry. America is falling behind on all fronts, and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson has for some time been sounding the alarm that the nation needs to fast track its space program. In my opinion, we do not have as much time as we had after Pearl Harbor. But we do have time, and we do have determination, and we do have willpower. Johnson secures billions of dollars in congressional support for NASA, and not just to beat the Soviets. Lyndon Johnson believed that there was a direct link between Southern poverty and Southern racism. Johnson's federal funding for NASA facilities would help transform the region into a new South, with high-tech jobs for a generation of African Americans. Construction progressed to this quarter on Marshall's new load test facility. NASA was in the South, and from the time that President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, NASA hired 250,000 people in Alabama, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. When you hire 250,000 people in the Deep South, and you tell the people hiring them that they cannot discriminate on the basis of race, that is going to change the South. One of those workers is student Morgan Watson, one of seven African-American engineers employed at NASA's huge Rocket City in Huntsville, Alabama. We had all studied real hard, and we all just wanted to go places. At that time, all I wanted to think about was how to get out of the cotton field. They invited us to work at NASA, or at the Marshall Space Flight Center. It was a, quite an honor. I knew that the mission was to put the man on the moon, and it was just, uh, I guess, a feeling of pride to be able to be involved in it. Watson works on the team developing the booster rockets for the Apollo program. Loud and hot, five rocket nine F-1 engines on an 11,000-mile journey trip to the moon. Well, the overall mission was to beat the Soviets. No detail could go unaddressed. It was just too important a mission. It's a double-edged sword. Watson and his African-American colleagues are under extra scrutiny in a white man's world. If a white man messed up at work, it was like, ah, oh, Steve doesn't know what he's doing. Ah, oh, Charlie doesn't know what he's doing. Any of these black employees at NASA messed up. It wasn't, oh, he messed up. It was, those people can't handle this kind of important work. And outside Rocket City, its African-American employees are still bound by the Jim Crow rules of segregation. When you leave NASA, you're in Huntsville. And Alabama in the 1960s was not a good place for black people. You didn't want to get arrested by the police. You didn't want to get picked up for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, we stopped a little hamburger stand or whatever to get a burger or something. And they said, we don't serve niggas here. You definitely had to pick your fights. And our fight was to open the door for black professionals, black engineers to come behind us. 500 miles away in South Carolina, 
another African-American is catching space fever. At nine years old, Ronald McNair already knows he wants to be an astronaut, but he must first confront racism in his own hometown. Ron had a precocious appetite for learning. So this one particular day, he's nine years old now, this is 1959. He had decided that he was going down to the public library and he was going to check out two books, a calculus book, as a matter of fact. And he walks in, all these faces are staring at him. He knew that he wasn't supposed to be there. He said, I would like to check out these books. He says, young man, you better leave this library, otherwise I'm going to call the police. Ronnie got thrown out of the library for being a black kid. It was highly improbable that my brother or anybody else from that time who came from our hometown would become an astronaut. Against the odds, McNair's tenacity will eventually pay off in ways he and his family could never imagine. In 1967, five long years after Ed Dwight's rejection, America finally taps a black astronaut, pilot Robert Lawrence, Jr. Do yourself feel that this is a tremendous step forward in, in racial relations? No, I don't think this is a, especially a tremendous step forward. I think it's just another one of the things that uh, we look forward to in this country uh, with respect to the progress in civil rights. But his historic candidacy is tragically cut short. On December 8, 1967, Lawrence is involved in a high-speed training accident at Edwards Air Force Base. He's killed instantly. And the reaction reveals that some in America aren't ready to embrace a black astronaut. After Bob was killed, I got a letter from some irate citizen that said that they were glad that he was dead because now there would be no coons on the moon. Yet again, America's space program is all white. African Americans are increasingly angry and are about to show it on NASA's biggest day ever. In July 1969, America is on the brink of a huge win in the space race, putting a man on the moon. But just a day before the launch, NASA faces a massive protest. The Poor People's Campaign descends on Cape Kennedy with mules to represent American inequality, and that eight million African Americans live in poverty while three billion dollars is being spent on space. We were for the advances of science wherever they might come, but we still don't want to forget the least of these God's children. And I think that was Dr. King's message in life. I can hear him saying, wait a minute, don't get to the moon and forget the poverty that we have here on Earth. For any nation, that will spend billions of dollars to put a man on the moon and will not spend $60 to stand one on its feet right down here on Earth. If it were possible for us tomorrow morning to not push the button and to solve the problems to which you are concerned, believe me, we would not push the button. Columbia, this is Houston reading you loud and clear over. We copy it down, Eagle. Uh, I believe they're setting up the flag now. OK, that looks good, Neil. A rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the moon. Her face and arms began to swell, and Whitey's on the moon. I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. Whitey on the Moon was an effective protest song because it forced people to confront the hypocrisy of America at this time. America put a man on the moon, but at the same time, we hadn't figured out how to treat everyone with equality. This was another major moment 
where the Soviet Union was able to point to the hypocrisy of the U.S. government. Людей травят собаками, избивают дубинками. Тысячи негров и тех, кто выступает в поддержку их борьбы, брошены в тюрьмы. Расисты совершают погромы, оставив мирных жителей без крова только за то, что они черные. Позор Америки! As the space race moves into the 70s, the Soviets make a big new move. They invite candidates from their allied nations to become cosmonauts, to show the world how progressive and diverse they are. It's part of what they call the Intercosmos program. It's an opportunity to do one step ahead of the United States before their program goes into full operation. They began this program first with the very closely aligned Warsaw Pact nations and also Cuba. In 1978, one of the Intercosmos candidates chosen is pilot Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez from Cuba. Not only is he Latin American and from a third world country, he's also of African descent. Cuba. Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez. Mendez. We needed to know how to speak Russian. You needed between 8 and 10 years of flight experience and a flawless flight record. And your health, mentally and physically, had to be above and beyond. And I was one of the 41 Cuban pilots who met all of those requirements. America is still way behind in recruiting a more diverse class of astronauts. But they found assistance from an unlikely source, Hollywood. Strong interference on subspace, Captain. The planet must be a natural radio source. Hi, I'm Nichelle Nichols, but I still feel a little bit like Lieutenant Uhura on the Starship Enterprise. Star Trek was really a breakthrough series because this showed a future of an integrated world. This was the first time an African-American, male or female, had appeared in a role such as this, where she was fourth in command of the Starship Enterprise. And that shows some possibility that maybe one day we might be able to do things like that. It's still an all-white male astronaut corps. Yeah. People are somewhat, uh, well, the credibility is rather zero with NASA <laughs> in the minority community <laughs> and females. One viewer who sees the ad is Air Force test pilot Frederick Gregory. I decided, okay, if she said I should do it, then I will apply. And that's the only reason I applied. NASA's campaign attracts a record 8,000 applicants. A big part of the appeal is the new space shuttle. Its revolutionary design allows it to carry a crew of up to nine, which gives scope to recruit astronauts who aren't fighter pilots. When they knew that the crew cabins were going to expand in size, they thought, we can put doctors on these flights. We can put scientists on these flights. Not only can we put different types of people professionally in these shuttles, we can put different types of people racially and by gender in these shuttles. And in January 1978, NASA selects its most diverse class ever, including the nation's first trio of African-American astronauts, Bluford, McNair, and Gregory. Finally, it looks like America is on the verge of getting the first black man into space. But quietly, two months later, Cuban Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez starts training as a potential Soviet cosmonaut. This forgotten chapter of the space race is heating up. Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez is an unlikely candidate to make history. Born to a poor family in eastern Cuba and orphaned as an infant, he grows up dreaming of becoming a fighter pilot. Well, you know, I grew up close to the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo. So I used to see the fighter jets flying overhead. 
The Cuban Revolution provides an opportunity for Tamayo Mendes to join the Air Force. He's a top combat pilot and at just 19, flying reconnaissance missions during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 1,300 miles north in Philadelphia, a young African-American man also falls in love with flight. I was fascinated with airplanes. After college, I went to pilot training. We had a fighter pilot come into my base, and he was a black guy. I had never seen a black pilot. And he was a Tuskegee Airman, and he was impressive. I remember walking out of that saying, I want to be a fighter pilot. I flew all over, dropped bombs all over South Vietnam. I flew combat two out of every three days. And I spent nine months flying fighters and I was anxious to get home. I saw this thing about flying in space, uh, Neil Armstrong uh, stepping out on the moon, so I applied for the program. I got this call from this guy, and he said, I'm from NASA. Would you like to come to Houston? In 1978, now a married family man in Ohio, Bluford gets the chance of a lifetime to go to Houston where he's in line to be selected as the first African-American astronaut. The U.S. seems to be ahead in the race. But in secret, at the same time, Tamaya Mendes is training in the Soviet Union. His name won't be publicized unless he actually gets chosen to go into space. The race is entering its final stage. Then we were sent to Moscow for training. The fact that we had been chosen to represent Cuba on a such a high level was a moment of a lot of happiness. He was a fighter pilot, therefore he understood everything. He was good with technology with a deep respect for everything. When it's decided that it's you, all of the responsibility of the task at hand is now on your shoulders. Because one mistake, one act of forgetfulness, anything that could make this mission fail was going to be an extraordinary load on our shoulders. Back in Ohio, the euphoria around Bluford being picked to go to NASA is overshadowed. Within days of his selection, his mother calls from her hospital bed. My mother called me out of the blue and said, hey, I'm having a medical problem, and the doctor gives me six months to live. I remember that. Mom was dying. She began to question if she did a good job in raising her, her three sons. And uh, she was just basically uh, um, asking if she <clears throat> She was basically asking if she did a good job. And I think I was a lot more successful than she had even imagined. I think I surprised her. My mother died, so um, we put our house up on the market and we moved. And uh, I went to work as an astronaut. Two men, 
training for the mission to space. Two representatives of competing superpowers, both unaware of each other or their roles in the larger propaganda tug of war. But only one would become the first black man in space. On September 18, 1980, there's news from Kazakhstan, the Soviet launch site. Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez, a Cuban chosen by the Soviets, has become the first black man in space. I have always been where I needed to be when an opportunity presented itself. The objective here wasn't to be the first black person in space. It was just a reality. I remember on the morning of the 19th, we ran over to the navigation system. And you could see Cuba very clearly, the same way you see it on a map, looking like a small crocodile that never sleeps. And I was imagining all the kids waking up to go to school, all the workers getting ready to go to work. Everyone was waking up to go about their day. Romanenko and I gave each other a strong hug because we were both very emotional to be able to see that small island. Tamayo Mendez is lionized, both in the Soviet Union and at home, where he is awarded the title of hero of the Republic of Cuba. I wasn't prepared for what came afterwards. The attention, the love, and affection that I got from the people on the street. I wasn't ready for that. If anyone foresaw the issue of race coming up in the space program, it would have been Fidel Castro. He was the one who was aware of the racial issues. Russians were amazed that this little country dared to challenge America. We were proud of them, and I was proud. America. The Soviets have sent the first black man into space. The fact that he is Cuban sends a message to nations of people of color. They will be rewarded if they align with the USSR. There was buzz around NASA that the Russians had flown a Cuban. They were thinking in terms of changing the geopolitical landscape a little bit and showing that they were capable of diversity. It said a lot about the Cold War and where we were. The U.S. didn't seem to want to acknowledge the Cuban and Soviet triumph. The American press barely mentioned Tamayo Mendez's flight. The U.S. cannot now be the first, but it still has to deliver. And finally, three years later, it does. In a few hours, the space shuttle Challenger is scheduled to lift off from its pad at Cape Canaveral. Because the launching is at night, it promises to be a beautiful sight. In August 1983, 20 years after Edward Dwight's rejection and 16 years after Robert Lawrence's death, Guy Bluford gets selected for the eighth shuttle mission. His maiden voyage would attract even more attention because it's the first night launch. NASA is on the brink of making history. But Houston has a new problem. 
This is shuttle launch control. We'll continue to stand by and wait word to uh, our ability to resume the countdown for the launch of STS-8. The voice of launch control, Mark Hess, just announced a few moments ago that it doesn't look promising for a launch tonight. We went out to the vehicle, and we still had radar and lightning. And we had lots of people out there, 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, and they're all rooting for you. I recognize the historical significance of it. We weren't even sure that we were going to get off that night. This is shuttle launch control, holding. As you know by now, the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger is delayed, but just recently we heard from NASA that the Air Force seems to think it's cleared and that there is a chance that it may go off in a few minutes. We have just received a go to pick up the count. Countdown started and it was exciting. Verify they are ready for launch. Six, five, we have engine start. Two, one. We have ignition and we have liftoff. Liftoff. Roger tank. to see the sky lit up. And when you looked around, you saw, saw tears in people's eyes. It was just so beautiful. It's just like the sun, it lights up the sky. Challenger, Houston, you're going throttle up. At about two minutes into the flight, the solid rocket boosters fall away. And you go from three times the speed of sound to 25 times the speed of sound. Fabulous ride. Roger Houston, we're looking at the moon. Roger that. How's that picture now, Jeff? Can you see uh, Guy and Dan? Both of them are in there, working hard. No rest for the weary. I was the guy who had to launch the satellite, so we got the cargo bay doors open, and I kicked the satellite out. OK, everything looks good to us. When you're in space, each crew member has a sleeping bag. And when it came time to go to sleep, you can Velcro it to the wall or ceiling or floor. I didn't like sleeping in the sleeping bag, so I got a piece of string, tied it to the locker, and floated it out in the middle of the room, and put eye shades on and fell asleep. Challenger Houston's with you at Hawaii. The president is on the line. Congratulations, Guy. You, I think, are paving the way for many others, and you're making it plain that we are in an era of brotherhood here in our land, and you will serve as a role model for so many others and be so inspirational. After 22 years of setbacks, the White House can finally trumpet the historic achievement of its first African-American in space. Six days later, the shuttle comes home successfully. Picking up the orbiter. And we mark touchdown at uh, 8 minutes, 40 seconds. Roger, copy. Welcome back. Great show. I'm really humbled tonight uh, to see as many people out here at 4 o'clock in the morning to welcome us back. When Guy Bluefoot landed, it was like he was a rock star. Him being the first African American to do that was very important for the nation to see. Guy Bluford has launched a new era of American spaceflight. No longer all white, no longer all male, but all too soon, the nation would be reminded of the sacrifices its brave astronauts have taken on in their attempts to make history. The second African-American on the launch pad was Ronald McNair, Bluford's 1978 classmate. Ron was a pure scientist. He had so many skills that were unique, a laser physicist. 
and a black belt in karate and a trained jazz musician. This is a guy with a lot of abilities that you just wouldn't find in the regular person. McNair first went up into space in 1984, but it was his second flight in 1986, also on Challenger, that would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. I was supposed to be on Challenger, but they flipped us. They flipped us. And so Ron McNair was launched in my slot. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Krista McAuliffe, our teacher in space. Well, I am so excited. And I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. Here comes the uh, 51 hour flight crew. We were, of course, excited to watch the launch take place. I knew it was something that could be dangerous, but yet he had gone up and come back. So it was just another trip. Mission specialist Ron McNair and payload specialist. Greg In mission control that day was Fred Gregory. They went to the pad that morning, and um, it was cold morning. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. We, we have the command, go with throttle up, which means that as far as we can tell, everything is OK. That's basically an assurance call to the crew. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. was a monitor back over my left shoulder by the flight director, and I looked at it, and suddenly I saw this plume. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. I saw it occur. Everybody else is face down looking at their displays. I don't know if anybody had looked up. It suddenly became very quiet, and all of the data on the screens, all of the data went to zero. And we're, the rest of the mission control is just totally stunned. It was just horrible. sitting in my office watching the launch on television when it, it all happened. You know, immediately I started crying. My dad got up and he said, what's going on? I said, you got to look at this. I just gestured towards the TV. And that was the first time in my life I ever saw my father cry. I. Uh for some reason thought that it was all going to work out, that Ron was going to be able to survive through this, but it didn't happen. The whole agency was in shock. So they canceled all the missions to investigate. Astronauts had to stop and say to themselves, do I stay or go? My attitude was very simple. Um, I owed it to Ron and the people who got killed to stay around and make sure we flew it again. America at its best, two women, a Jew, a black, an Asian, white males, at our best as a nation. Challenger is a reminder of the risks of space exploration. 
but its crew represents a promise to inspire new generations. Our family had gone from slavery to space in four generations, and we thought that was something special. As of 2020, 11 African-American men and three women have been to space, out of a total of 338 astronauts. Sometimes it's slow coming, sometimes it's an evolution, sometimes it's a revolution. We needed to have Guy Bluford as much as we needed Jackie Robinson. I grew by leaps and bounds. I just found how the world worked. I wanted people to say, when I grow up and become an astronaut, I'm gonna be like Bluford. It's something you never forget. I am the first black man in space. 